I don't want to interrupt them. Okay. Are we ready? Um, Are we done? Are we we're done. done. Right. Five minute class. We're ready. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we come before you again this week, and we ask you to open up our hearts and our minds to your word as we continue in the book of Genesis. As we look at your word from the church's fathers and the church teaching and what, and what the uh, theologians have to say, we ask you to open up our hearts and minds so that your word can enter into us and cause change and cause us to grow and cause us to be inflamed with the power of your Holy Spirit. So we call upon the Holy Spirit as we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful, and kindle with us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Our Lady, seed of wisdom, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, last week we covered two chapters. Hopefully we'll get a couple this week, but chapter three was so important that, and there's things that I was in a rush for that I didn't show you that I sort of want to recap here. So I put together um, a few slides just to give you some typology of chapter three and also um, a comparison between the old and the new. So let me just pull this up. Wait a minute, hold on a second. I have to make my password so strong, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> All right. Confessions of an IT guy. Yeah, that's right. All right. So, chapter three was on the fall, right? Uh, chapter two, Adam and, and Eve was created from a side. Chapter three was the fall. So I'm just gonna recap some of the typology of chapter three. Hopefully everybody can see this. Um, Mm -hmm. So the, the old, uh, St. Augustine had said this. This is attributed to St. Augustine, right? I, and I keep repeating this at every Bible study I'm at. But the new is concealed in the old, and the old is revealed in the New Testament, right? So it's one thread. It's not like the old is no longer needed, and are we, are we're just New Testament people. No, the whole Bible together is the Word of God, uh, the written Word of God, and it uh, is a thread, from Christ, right? From the Old Testament, right to the, right through Revelation, the end of, of the New Testament. And we're going to take a look at chapter three and this, how this thread goes from the fall of Genesis into redemption history, into the um, diatheke, what's called the new covenant, the new diatheke. So we have Adam, right? And we have Jesus. We have Eve, we have Mary. That's pretty much no brainer. We have an angel. And by the way, for those who aren't here, Last time, uh, the thought is, is that the angel that had sort of kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, that, that guarded the cherubim, right, the guard, is uh, uh, that what was one of the angels was the same as the one in the Annunciation, which was Gabriel. So it's interesting how some of the theologians and the thought there is that's the same angel who had to banish Adam and Eve, and who actually waited all this time, right, to to manifest the redemption, you know, from the fall to Mary. And uh, so we have, of course, angel in both scenarios, right? Because who was the angel? Gabriel came to Mary. We have a garden, right? The Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane, where the redemption is starting to take place. We have the tree, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they partook of, and the tree of the cross. There's fruit from that tree, which they ate. One caused death. The other is life, the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And of course, it is the act of eating, right, that causes, that causes not only the fall, so it's the act of eating that sort of causes our redemption. What do we partake of when we eat? The Holy Eucharist. That's our salvation, right? Jesus is our salvation. They took from the tree. Jesus gives his life on the tree. And clothed and naked. So after the fall, Adam and Eve were clothed, right? They clothed themselves with fig leaves, and then God actually ended up clothing them with animal skins. Um, but they lost that glory, and they were naked and ashamed, so they clothed themselves. But when Jesus went to the cross, Roman crucifixion was stripping, totally, right? So we have loincloth on them for, you know, for, for image purposes, but, but 
Normally, the crucifixions were completely, they're completely stripped of all their clothes naked, right? So this clothing and naked is very important when it comes to um, sin and redemption because notice that Adam and Eve were naked before they sinned and clothed after they sinned. Jesus has never sinned, never sinned, right? He, he's God, he's perfect, and he's naked, like uh, hence back to that state where I'm bringing you, I'm bringing you, I'm conquering sin, going back to that pristine state. And just as the two, Adam and Eve, cooperated, right, to bring the fall of all mankind, so to cooperate, right, to bring about redemption. And that's, of course, Jesus and Mary. And just as Adam and Eve were without sin, the two were without sin, all right? Mary and her immaculate conception, and just as there was an angel, as we mentioned, one fallen to Satan, so there was an angel in the garden to comfort Jesus. So, Brian, I think you said last time that you thought the angel who was escorted out of the garden was the same as the angel of the Annunciation. But it begs the question, is it also the same, Gabriel? So, mm -hmm. is it also the same angel as in the Agnes That's a good point. That's a good point. I don't know. I don't know that, but, but Has it, ever been it very well could be the same the same comforting angel. It didn't give a name, it just said it, but it didn't give a name right. in the Old Testament either. Right, right but I'm wondering, because we only have the name of the Annunciation. So it could be the thread, right? That thread between the old and the new being the same angel who's carrying that thread. Well, I'm just wondering, because we only have the name of the Annunciation. So we're extrapolating that it might be the same. That's right, that's right, that's, right. that's what they're doing. When we similarly yeah. extrapolate that it might be the same the Agony. That's right. That's okay. right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And that's the thought, right? Uh, so even though it's not named in the old or in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, it is named in the Annunciation. So we're extrapolating that. And then the angel, Gabriel, I greeted the Virgin uh, when the fall of mankind happened, right? Uh, so too does an angel greet a virgin with redemption. Because we know the Adam and Eve were virgins before they, they, they came together. They're created virginally from the virgin earth, Adama. You mean so they didn't, in other words, they didn't consummate their marriage until after the fall? Not, they did. God said to be fruitful and multiply. So, no, I would say that they did. But when they were first there, the, angel, the angels came and they greeted them. So I don't know 100% on that answer, if, if that's okay. the case. Um, but we do know, right, that Eve gave her fiat... All right, to Satan. What's a fiat? Your yes, your 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 obedience, your 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 answer, right? And gave on the converse her no to God, because she didn't obey him. So God said, You shall not eat from the fruit of this tree. And on the other hand, Mary gave her fiat to God, which automatically, right, she's she's an enmity with the with the, the Satan, with the serpent. So she when she gave her fiat to God, she totally belongs to him, which we knew from her immaculate conception anyways. But do you see what's going on here? These are parallels. These are parallels that the scripture, um, that the theologians and the fathers are bringing all this out. I'm going to show you the father's quotes here in a minute. Eve prompted Adam to commit his first bad act, right? She handed him the fruit to eat. She's prompting him. But Mary prompts Jesus to commit in the... Gospels, right, that we know that first good act toward redemption, which is what? What he feeds the Cana? Some have no wine. See, see, see the common, see, see what's going on here, the parallels. Eve conceives death by eating, right? Mary conceives life in her womb. And just as the fruit was taken from the tree in the garden, thus causing the fall, that fruit of Mary's womb was put back on the tree. And finally, just as eating the bad fruit caused the death, eating the good. So it's about eating, right? We're talking about here. So these, I'm not going to keep reading, right? But you'll get this, right? That, that these are parallels that we're seeing between the Old Testament and the New. And everything goes back to Genesis in that sense, right? If you want to look, the scriptures, when they're written and they're based as salvific history is going on, that it comes back to Genesis. Uh, almost everything comes back to Genesis because that's where it started and that's where the fall happened. All right, so I want to pick up with a quote here from JP2, John Paul II. And this is from Redemptoris Mater, the mother of the Redeemer, in his encyclical. It says, the divine plan of salvation, which was fully revealed to us with the coming of Christ, is eternal. And according to the teaching contained in the letter, in the other Pauline letters, it's eternally linked to Christ. 
and includes everyone. So we're all, because of the fall, right, we're, we're all included in this. But it's reserved in a special place for the woman who is the mother of him to whom the Father has entrusted the work of salvation. As Vatican II says, she is already prophetically foreshadowed in that promise made to our first parents after the fall. So we talked about this last week, the Proto-Evangelium, right? Genesis 3.15, which is where uh, the first gospel, that's what that word Proto-Evangelium means. And this is where God's promising redemption. He sees what happened. He confronted Adam and Eve, right? And the blame game started and they started blaming everybody. They blamed the serpent. He did some cursing on the serpent and the ground, right, the earth and the ground. But then he said this in 3.15, Behold, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. You will bruise her heel, and she shall crush your head. So that is the promise of the redemption. It's the promise of the Messiah coming. And that's what John Paul's talking about. It's foreshadowed with that woman, uh, that Isha that we talked about last week. And here's the quotes from the fathers I just want to pick up on. Uh, this is from Irenaeus, who, who I love saying Irenaeus. Um, he, he, he's written some awesome quotes. But this says, The knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. For what the virgin Eve had bound fast through unbelief, Mary did through faith, through belief. So if you look at the picture, that's, that's a modern picture, obviously, but that's Eve, right, in her sinful, uh, shameful state with a serpent around her leg, right? And she's, like, covered with things from the garden, and there's Mary, right, who is the new Eve, consoling her in a way, right? Um, and I said this last week at the end of the teaching. I, it wasn't really part of, of the Bible study, but I think I was in a conversation with someone, and I said this, that when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified at, uh, on Calvary, right? Calvary means cranium. It's not really the actual, the, the name of it was Golgotha, which is the place of the skull, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know when the earth quaked, and the rock split, according to Matthew's gospel, it said that. What the thought is there is that Jesus was crucified over where Adam was buried. This is why at the base of a crucifix, especially in the Byzantine, you'll see skulls and crossbones down there. Because that's the place. And it's also the exact place where Mount Moriah was, where Abraham's son Isaac carried the wood of his cross, remember? as a foreshadowing type of Christ. And then when he went to kill Isaac, the angels, God said, no, no, don't harm your son, right? And then provided that lamb for the replacement. Well, that lamb ultimately is Jesus who will die in the place right of. Um, so the Calvary where he died is that place where Adam, and he, where Adam was buried, where um, Isaac took upon his cross Mount Moriah to do the sacrifice where, where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. So when the, when the rock split, right, when he died and the earthquake happened, the beautiful teaching and thought is, and I can't quote the exact person who came up with this, but, um, or theologian or father, is that the blood of the cross, the blood from Christ would trickle down from the cross into those cracks down into the grave to redeem Adam. It's a beautiful thought. It really is. Um, so that is, that is uh, uh, the new Eve here, obviously, Mary consoling Eve, but Jesus, the new Adam, redeeming Adam. And not only does he redeem Adam, he redeems the whole race of Adam, which is every human being, right? Because we all derive from, from, from our first parents. So we're all redeemed through the Christ, but it doesn't mean that everyone's saved. It's a big difference, right? Everyone's redeemed because Jesus died for the redemption of the world and for the salvation of all, but not everyone is saved. So that's, that's the thought here. And you see this with the new Eve, Mary comforting Eve. And then, of course, we have Tertullian, who wasn't really declared a saint. There were some things that were considered heretical with him a little bit, but he is a church father. And this is around the second, third century. He said, for a while it was Eve, while she was yet a virgin, that the ensnaring word had crept into her ear, which was to build the edifice of death into a virgin soul, in like manner must be introduced the word of God, which was to raise the fabric of life. So it is that word, right? The devil was speaking a word to Eve in her ear. Did not God say as a tempting word? It was a diabolical word, but it was a word nonetheless. So the word of life, Jesus Christ, the second person of blessed Trinity, becomes incarnate, Right? to bring life, not death. That word brings life. That's why 
um, it pierces even to the division of spirit, soul, joint, and marrow, right? And it's the discerner of the thoughts and the tense of the heart. And we feast on the word himself at mass. That is our life. The Holy Eucharist is our life. And then St. Ephraim, 4th century, said, With the body that was from the virgin, Jesus entered into Sheol and plundered its storehouses and emptied its treasures. He came then to Eve, the mother of all the living. This is the vine whose fence death laid open by her own hands and caused her to taste of his fruits. So Eve, the mother of all the living, became the wellspring of death to all the living. But Mary budded forth a new shoot from Eve, the ancient vine. And the new life dwelt in her, that when death should come confidently after his custom to feed upon mortal fruits, the life that is the slayer of death might be stored up therein against him. So we see here that this shoot, you ever read in the Old Testament, we read this um, in Christmas time, uh, that this, the shoot of Jesse shall arise, or, or, you know, the, the, the stump, the shoot, the branch shall arise. Well, that's all Jesus, right? The, the branch, by the way, in the Old Testament, that a branch shall bud forth, that branch is Nazareth in, in Hebrew. It means Nazareth. Nazareth is literally, literally called branch town, shoot town. So when the Old Testament is prophesizing about this shoot that shall bud forth, this branch that shall stem forth, it's about the Messiah, the Messiah, Jesus. Okay? And so what Ephraim is telling us here is that this branch is life. Again, we're putting this thread together of life conquering death because we just saw death come into play in that chapter, in chapter 3. And then, this is, this is interesting. This, this is attributed to St. Athanasius. As for Eve, she is the mother of the dead. Now, now, it's funny because she's explained as being that her name means mother of the living. But Athanasius saying mother of the dead, for in Adam all die, even so in Christ all should be made alive. Eve took the fruit from the tree and made her husband eat of it along with her, and so they ate of that tree which God had told them, the day you shall eat of it, you shall not die. So what he's saying is that she's the mother of the dead. And the new Eve is truly the mother of the living, but it is the mother of eternal life, of, of Jesus who brings us eternal life. So it's it, this eternal living that we're talking about. And the temporal living happened because of sin, because we're, we're meant to live eternally. That's why our souls are immortal. We have an immortal soul, which means our souls will, will live forever. So I just wanted to share that's a, that's a summary of chapter, chapter three. There's so much in there for those who weren't here last week. Um, and now we're going to turn now to chapter four, uh, because now that they're banished from, from the garden, right, um, and he has to till the ground and work it, right, and she's bearing uh, children, right, in pain, that's part of, that's part of the, the result of the fall, right, that she bore children, but we're going to look at two of them in this chapter four, and we're going to see what happens with them both. If anybody has any questions on chapter three, uh, and even afterwards, you know, feel free to ask me. Um, I, I did even more research, and I have all the notes from it, so I just don't want to go over the whole chapter again. We'll be here again till eight thirty doing that. Mm -hmm. So I guess Tracy, since you have the Bible and you have the microphone, I'll have Kathy read. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Then Adam had intercourse with his wife, and she became pregnant. She bore a son and said, By the Lord's help, I have gotten a son. So she named him Cain. Later she gave birth to another son, Abel. Abel became a shepherd, but Cain was a farmer. After some time, Cain brought some of his harvest and gave it as an offering to the Lord. Then Abel brought the first lamb born to one of his sheep, killed it, and gave the best parts of it as an offering. The Lord was pleased with Abel and his offering, but he rejected Cain and his offering. Cain became furious, and he scowled in anger. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why that scowl on your face? If you had done the right thing, you would be smiling. But because you have done evil, sin is crouching at your door. It wants to rule you, but you must overcome it. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out in the fields. When they were out in the fields, Cain turned on his brother and killed him. The Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He answered, I don't know. Am I supposed to take care of my brother? Then the Lord said, 
Why have you done this terrible thing? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, like a voice calling for revenge. You are placed under a curse and can no longer farm the soil. It has soaked up your brother's blood as if it had opened its mouth to receive it when you killed him. If you try to grow crops, the soil will not produce anything. You will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, This punishment is too hard for me to bear. You are driving me off of the land and away from your presence. I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. But the Lord answered, No. If anyone kills you, seven lives will be taken in revenge. So the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who met him not to kill him. And Cain went away from the Lord's presence and lived in a land called Wandering, which is east of Eden. Cain and his wife had a son and named him Enoch. Then Cain built a city and named it after his son. Enoch had a son named Irad, who was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael had a son named Methushahel, who was the father of Lamech. Lamech had two wives, Ada and Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, who was the ancestor of those who raise livestock and live in tents. His brother was Jubal, the ancestor of all musicians who play the harp and the flute. Zillah gave birth to Tubal, Cain, who had made all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. I have killed a young man because he struck me. If seven lives are taken to pay for killing Cain, seventy-seven will be taken if anyone kills me. Adam and his wife had another son. She said, God has given me a son to replace Abel, whom Cain killed. So she named him Seth. Seth had a son whom he named Enosh. It was then that people began using the Lord's holy name in worship. Okay. So you notice that this chapter opens up and sort of ends with Adam knew his wife, right? Adam had relations with his wife. And they populated the earth. Now, this word, no, Adam knew, like some translations say no, uh, N, you know, N, K, N, O, W, right? Knew his wife. That means yada in Hebrew. And what yada is, is that it's an it's a intimate knowledge. It's not just a knowledge in the head. It's an experiential uh, marital covenant, like conjugal relation. So when the Bible always says that in that context, right, that's what it's talking about. So we see Adam married to Eve. And by the way, we saw in chapter two how they were married, right? Now God the Father had brought forth from the side of Adam, his bride, and then presented her to him like you would at a wedding, like a father would present his daughter to the bridegroom, right? This is, this is what the father was doing. So they were married there in the garden, and we see that they're being fruitful and multiplying, but they had a couple sons. Now, they also had daughters, by the way, but if you notice, the patriarchal line is always pretty much mentioned in the Old Testament. You will find uh, mention of female and, and matriarchy, uh, but mainly when it looks at lines of, of family genealogies, it goes by the patriarch, goes by the men. So you'll see that the, that the sons are talked about right here. And I want to just look at both of those, right, Cain and Abel. Now, Cain was, was born first, obviously, and then, and then Abel. And then we see quickly on this murder that takes place, right, uh, where Cain murders Abel. But let's look at their, what their names are, who named them, and what they did, what their role was, right? So what's interesting is that Cain, literally, that word means to possess, to acquire. Uh, and that's interesting because right away, the word means I have possessed. Abel is habel in Hebrew, which means vapor. And vapor is like, dissipates quickly. It disappears quickly. So we have, we see here the fulfillment of their names in a way, right? Abel was murdered and his life quickly disappeared. But Cain possesses, not only tries to possess Abel's life, but we're going to see here how he possesses his own, when he's tilling the ground, uh, doing the other fruits of the ground, he is actually um, trying to possess and hold it to himself instead of giving God the best in the first, which causes, right, which causes this, 
this whole mess to begin with. Did, did their names have those meanings when they received the names, or did they yes. get the meanings because of how they lived their lives? Well, that's a good point. I, I don't know exactly if it's because of what happened, but I assume the names, because if you look at like Jacob, he's striking at the heel of his brother, that name, you know, when he was coming because he came out of the womb second and they were wrestling to come out of the womb. So I assume those names have the meaning when they were named. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that the names are usually given by the father. But in this case, from what the theologians tell us, is that the mother is the one that named them. Okay, so when a mother gives the names, there's something lacking authoritatively in the Old Testament because the father had the authority. So maybe something was going on there. I don't know. This is just a footnote, right, of, of the study. But we notice that Cain early on, it becomes envious of his brother, not just jealous, but envious. We're going to talk about the difference between the two there as well in these offerings, right? You know, it says here in verse 8 that, well, I'm sorry, sorry, in verse, verse 6, the Lord says to him, you're angry. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Right? He's talking to Cain. And why do you think Cain's angry? Jealous. Jealous, yeah. Why would he be jealous, right? Because it all stems back to when they brought their offering, right? Abel brought the firstborn of his flock, right? And the Lord was pleased with that, right? But... Cain brought an offering, the fruit of the ground. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily, because so here's the thought, here's the thinking, that the ancient Israelites, they might have looked at Cain's offering as arrogant and presumptuous, right, by the fact that what is being offered was fruit without a bloody sacrifice. Now, just listen to this a second, and then I'll get to, to why that is. Fruit, the fruit, the offering of the fruit was a communion, right, a communion. But the bloody sacrifice was an offering for sin, can we have communion without the forgiveness of sin? In other words, can we go to communion, Holy Communion, receive the Holy Eucharist, in a state of mortal sin? No. no. So there has to be forgiveness for sin, right, first. There has to be this, that's why Jesus said, if you're on your way, you know, reconcile with your brother and everything. So there has to be this forgiveness of sin. So the thought here is that the ancient Israelites thought that, well, wait a minute, there needs to be this sacrifice first. This this bloody sacrifice first to atone for sin before there can be the communion with the fruit. So he took Abel's first, right? And that might have ticked Cain off. See? But we know that Cain didn't have the, well, at least it doesn't show here, the flocks, right? Abel was the, was, had the flocks and, and, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. So Cain shouldn't have been upset, right, in that case, because the Lord would very easily accept his, his offering as well. So there's something else going on, right? What's going on here is that, let's look at the name again, I have possessed. I have possessed, I, I, I acquire. So the thinking here with the patriarchs, the older patriarchs, is that Cain has this, this attitude of, of wanting to keep to himself, wanting to hoard and keep to himself. Look, look at the land I possess. Look at all the, 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 the fruits of the ground I do. Yes, I'm supposed to give to God something, yes. But here, you, you get this on Sunday and I do the rest, you know. The rest of the week's mine. <laughs> You're just going to have this hour on Sunday, so to speak, right? Whereas Abel gives the first, the first. Well, the first is usually the best, right? That's, that's just like, oh, i got to give the best up to him. Deacon Brian, just, uh, just one thing, one deep I'm curious about. Mm -hmm. It says Abel gave the, you know, the first of his flock. Of his flock mm -hmm. And of their fat portions, which suggests it was the best to eat. Yes. And yet God didn't authorize men to eat animals until after the flood. So, right? Or well, no, so, so it was, the, the, so the sacrifice was there, right? Because the sacrifice actually went back. God did the first sacrifice in the garden. Mm -hmm. He sacrificed the animal to cover Eve and Adam. Mm -hmm. So the sacrifice was already precedented now, right? We knew that the, something had to give its life in blood to cover something. So they, through the years, right, of, of Adam and Eve, and then having, of course, they're grown now, Cain and Abel, are, or they're somewhat grown, right? I mean, they're not children, were, knew about the sacrifice of, of the blood and the fat and the lambs and all that. Matter of fact, Abraham picks up on that too, but that's after, after Noah. So this was part of, uh, of their worship of what they were supposed to do to give to God. Uh, God initiated that first 
sacrifice, so to speak. Are they allowed, eating? Are they allowed at this point to eat meat or not? And if they're not allowed, then what is? What I, I don't. I, I would. So I. I, I don't think um, eating of meat. Yeah, I mean, he's a tiller of the ground, right? So, he, or I'm sorry, he's tiller of the flock. So I think the eating would be fine to eat the meat. I. Okay. I don't know 100 percent if so it, it hurts. when eating is. The only thing that that when we get to Noah, which I'm going to ask, by the way, next week, if we can get to Noah, because uh, our time is limited and it's just going to get better. So anyways, um, when it gets to Noah, you're going to see why these animals were put to death, what, the, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat, what was unclean, what was clean. See, that wasn't pronounced yet, but what we did know is that sacrifice was. Okay, so they gave to the Lord. You think the Lord is actually physically eating, eating it? No, but it's 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 part of this command, this mandate, right, to give unto the Lord His due. And that talks about last week what we talked about—the virtue of religion. I guess it's, it just seems that if they couldn't eat the lambs, it wouldn't have been a big deal to give them the best portions. Yeah, but you want to give God your best, whether you eat or not, right? Okay. So that's what I'm saying. You want to give Him your best. That's what God's looking for. You give Him your first. And your best. Are you just giving me your what's 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 making you comfortable? You know what is what is just the see. And we can look at it this way too, as far as our own faith. I think right. If we just say, you know what, I'm going to meet the minimum. Go to mass on Sunday, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the church asks for the minimum on a couple of things, right? Sunday mass, Saturday evening, Sunday mass, holy days of obligation, and confession once a year, right? So is that all we're going to do if we think we're going to be in the graces of God? No, right? So that's the minimum. So I think what's happening here is the same thing. I think Cain went for that minimalist idea, you know, like I'm just going to acquire, keep for myself and give God what is maybe absolutely necessary to do, whereas Abel is given the best in the first, right, of his flock, whether it was truly mandated or not. That's, that's how I, I see that, right? So, and that's a lesson to us too that, that we should do as well. But in the process of this, uh, what's happening is that Cain gets angry, right? And he gets jealous and he also gets envious. We're gonna talk about the difference there, but before we do, let's just see what happened here, all right? God says something very, very interesting in verse seven. Very interesting. It says, he knows that Cain is upset, and he asks him in verse 6, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? And in verse 7, he says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door, and its desire is to have you, for you, but you should rule over it. Now, I brought this up last week. So those who weren't here last week, let's take a look at Eve, right? After the fall, some things happened, right? And one of the things that the Lord is t talking to them now is he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow to her, to the woman, and your conception and in pain you shall bring forth a child. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Again, I said this last week that that word desire, when I first read that and did this study years and years ago, I'm thinking, well, yeah, her desire probably would be for her husband. Why not, right? I mean, she loves him, is married to him. That's not the word desire. It's not what that word desire means. And you know how we can prove that. It's right here what God is telling Cain, right, in verse 7. Sin desires to have you, but you shall rule over it. He says to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. See, So in other words, the desire is not a, a virtuous desire. It's a desire to assert, it's a desire to undercut, it's a desire to take control, it's a desire to be in the place of God, right? So sin wants to conquer Cain, but Cain shall rule over it, God says. Sin, the desire of Eve, her natural inclination now through the fall would be want to conquer her husband, right? And they shall rule over you. So, so this, is, this is what that word desire means in that sense. And Cain talked with Abel then, right? Did it make a difference in Cain's life? Obviously not, because he goes back and he talks with Abel. I mean, God's telling him, look, you will be accepted. Just do the right thing. Sin will try to have its desire, but you shall rule over it, right? Then in the next verse, he goes and talks with Abel. And it came to pass that when they're in the field, he rose up against them and killed them. All right? It just, 
See, that bitterness, that jealousy, that envy gets in there, and unless you deal with that, it'll just start growing like cancer, right? It'll just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow unless you try to deal with it. And then eventually it's going to have an outlet. It's going to just burst somewhere. And in this case, it burst onto Abel by, by you know, his life being taken. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? Right? So here it is again. In, if you look at, at chapter 3, God, when they sinned, when Adam and Eve fell, what did God say to them? Where are you? Right? What, what we, so he knew where they are. He knew what happened. Right? He wanted to get that confession from them. So what does he say to Cain? Where's your brother? Well, God knew. Right? He's God. He knew what happened. But he's getting that confession. I made this, this little thing last week, right, where you tell your, your four-year-old, you know, does something wrong, and you knew he did something wrong, right? But you're saying, now, what did you do? You know, what happened here? And you knew, but you want to get that confession from him, right? This is what God is doing. Where is your brother? And then what this classic line, am I my brother's keeper? You know, trying to escape out of the responsibility. Yes, you are. We all are, really. Yes, you are your brother's keeper, right? This is the same excuse that Adam and Eve sort of gave because they weren't each other's keeper. They blamed each other. Well, the woman you put here, she's the one that, that, mm -hmm. that, that tempted me. Okay, then God goes to the woman. Well, the serpent that you put, he's the one that, you know. So it's pointing, pointing, pointing. Cain's just like, you know, what am I? Who is he to me, right? So instead of being that keeper, he's trying to give excuses. And then the Lord says, what have you done? His brother's blood cries to me from the ground. You know what's really neat about that verse? There is a, there is a verse in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, that says the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than that of Abel. You, you ever read that? It's, it's in Hebrews. Um, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than that of Abel. Why do you think the author of the Hebrews, which a lot of people say is St. Paul, why do you think he said that? Can we say it again? The blood of Christ speaks a better word than that of Abel. In other words, your brother's blood, Abel's blood, is calling from the ground, crying to me from the ground, God saying, right? What word then, if that blood is crying and speaking to God from the ground, what is it saying? Abel? Yes. Vengeance. Vengeance. Right. Justice. It's got to be done here, right? But Christ says forgiveness. But Christ says forgiveness. So that word is much better, right? Much better. So God's willing to forgive Cain, right? But Cain is not repentant. He's not, right? And so, so he says, now you are cursed from the earth. Okay, cursed from the earth. Now we see a curse pronounced on a person. There was no curse pronounced on Adam and Eve when they fell. It was on the ground, right? Cursed is the ground. You shall, from the sweat of your brow, you shall work it. Cursed is the serpent on your belly. You shall crawl all the days of your life. But here we see a person being cursed, and it is, and it is Cain. You will till the ground and shall no longer yield its strength for you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And then Cain said, my punishment is more than I can bear. Now, God put a mark on Cain. I want to talk about this. What is that mark? All right. I did a lot of research trying to figure out what the different theologians, what the different scholars, what the different um, rabbis, you know, or, or, or the ancient Jewish writings has said about this mark. But before I get there, I just want to say that St. Augustine says something about Abel. He says that Abel was a type of the redeemed, the regenerated, and Cain of the natural, right? So we see here Cain and Abel as signs of the spiritual realities of what's going on, right? Cain, the natural man who left to his own devises will fall and sin every time and be self-bent and self-centered, right? Abel, representing the regenerate, redeemed, as St. Augustine says, right? What was the Abel? He was second born, wasn't he? Second born. All right. So how about Esau and Jacob? Who was the good one there in the line, in that one? You remember that story in the Old Testament? Who was, who was, who was the promised one? Esau or Jacob? Esau. Esau was the promised one, but what happened? Esau was right to his brother. So then Jacob is the one that actually got to be. Yes. Was Jacob the first or second born? Second. Who is the first or second born here in this one? 
Cain. Abel. Right? Okay? What's that saying? The first birth is into original sin. We're born into original sin at our first birth, at our birth, our biological birth. But our second birth in baptism, our second birth is eternal. Our second birth. So maybe God is showing through the second born here, through the Old Testament, that the eternal birth is really the one we're striving after. That's the one, not that the first one doesn't count, it's needed, but that second one is the one he's showing us, right? And he's showing us through Abel, the type of regenerated, redeemed, and Cain the natural. Augustine goes on to say, Cain founded a city on earth, but Abel, as a stranger and pilgrim, looked forward to the city of the saints in heaven. See that? See that combination again? The temporal versus the eternal. Abel also seemed to sacrifice his, his goods, right? His, his flock and everything right away, but Cain delayed in giving. Now, do we see that? I mean, I don't pick that out right here, but this is, this is the exegesis from this. This is what they're saying, is that um, he delayed. Again, that name, Kana, I possess, I acquire, right? Maybe he didn't want to let go of something. He's the first hoarder, right? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But nonetheless, it says um, that he supposed that his possession made him like God. In other words, I can be... You know, I want to possess. The more I have, the more secure I can be, right? So this got to him, and he killed his brother Abel. Now, what's going to be interesting is this mark, right? And I do want to talk about this. He killed his brother out of jealousy, envy, but here's the difference, right? Envy is much worse than jealousy. They're very similar, very, very similar. Why do you think envy would be worse than... Matter of fact, isn't envy one of the seven deadly sins? Yes. Yes, but you know, jealousy is a subcategory under it. But why would envy be worse than jealousy? Why, why do you think? Envy, you want what someone else has. Yes, that's a good point. Whereas jealousy is... Okay, here's an example. Jealousy says you admire your friend's purse, right? So <laughs> you say, guess what? I'm jealous of that purse. I'm going to go out and get myself one just like it. <laughs> Envy, you take it from the person, you set it on fire so they can never have it. Don't care if you get it either. I just don't want them to have it. You ever hear like in the news, this time stuff happening? You know, like there's a breakup of the family and maybe the husband loses his mind and he goes and he kills the kids because he doesn't, or he kills this, his girlfriend because he doesn't want anybody else to have her. Yes. You see, that's that's... That's the bitter end of envy. The envy is so deadly. That's why it's one of the deadly sins. Here's another one. All right? You see your neighbor's new car. And you become blank, envious or jealous, right? And so you go buy a new one to show it off yourself. What would that be? Jealousy. Jealousy. You see your neighbor's new car and you become blank. So you pour sugar down the gas tank so you can never have it. <laughs> so we're getting ahead here. We know the difference, right? Well, envy is what got... Cain, right? He's going to take his brother away so nobody is going to compliment him again, right? He's, Cain could have said, you know what? I'm jealous of him. I'm going to work twice as hard as him next time so I can then produce. He's going to produce the first of his flock. I'm going to produce all of it the next time for God. Here you go. I'll show him up. No, he just took him off the scene, just like what envy would do. Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. Deadly sin. Deadly sin. So Satan was not just jealous of God, but he was envious, but he couldn't take him out. But he tried that war in heaven, didn't he? Tried to overthrow heaven to do that. You know, the book of wisdom tells us that through the devil's envy, and it uses the word envy, that death entered the world. Wisdom 2.24. So the devil doesn't just want to acquire us either. He just doesn't want to, you know, have us on his side. He wants to destroy us as well. That's why he's a lion seeking to destroy whom he shall, right? That's what the Bible says. He's a roaring lion Seeking destroy to destroy. And so, being a son of the devil and filled with envy, Cain destroys Abel. Okay. So then what happens is, I do not know my brother. Am I my brother's keeper? Doesn't even care. No repentance. No repentance there, right? Because you think repentance would happen right there. Oh, I'm caught. Lord, forgive me. Even, and you see, here's the thing with repentance. And this is, I'm going to talk about confession a little bit too. 
is that when we go to confession, right, this is why we need to go to confession because you can be forgiven if you have uh, perfect contrition. <laughs> I've never seen perfect contrition done with anyone, perfect. ever. Perfect contrition is to be completely, totally sorry and detached from your sins, right? Like, for the love of God, not for the sake of your own soul. In other words, most people, when they sin, they're immediately afraid for their own soul. God, forgive me, God, forgive me, I don't want to go to hell, I don't want to be judged, I want to do this, right? So they got something in it for themselves, right? Father Ripperger calls that interested love versus disinterested love, right? Disinterested love means I'm not interested in myself, I'm, I'm interested in the person I hurt. So I'm so sorry because of you and who you are, God, I am sorry. I don't think anybody, maybe some of the saints did, maybe like the Padre Pio's of the world, you know, those real strong, had that kind of love for God where it's total detachment and totally the other. Well, the this is why perfect. we need confession. We yes. can't be perfect because we're human, so the word right. perfect shows that we so, almost can't. Answer. That's right, but the word perfect in the Greek and in the Hebrew, the word perfect is teleos in the Greek, and in the Hebrew it's gamar. You know what that means? It means to cease. Mm. You, you to cease. So you're ceasing striving in that perfection, right? And you're moving in God's grace. It also means an end. You're at the end, you're ceasing, end, right? That's what teleos means, your end. So God's calling us to come to the end of ourselves by being perfect, be perfect for your father's perfect, so that he can take over, right? So that's, that's hard to do. So well, we need confession, because confession will forgive you of those mortal sins, whether you have perfect contrition or not, because it's through the sacrament of the church in the person of Christ, who's in the priest, the persona Christi. So it's Christ giving you that absolution, not the priest. It is Jesus. And you know through the audible word, the, the form coming out of his mouth, that you, when you hear it, it is there. It is truly there. That's why people actually feel it when they come out of confession much better because it's actually an ontological thing that happens to you as well. So if in confession, and forgive me, Father, if I get this wrong, because I'm sure he's going to listen to this. Um, in confession, <laughs> if you have the form, te absolvo, I absolve you, right? What's the matter? For instance, what's the matter in baptism? Water. Water. What's the matter in, in, in the Holy Eucharist? Bread. What's the matter in confession? Words. No, the words are the form. And, 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 and I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, it's the form, the water's the matter. The Eucharist, this is my body, that's the form, the bread's the matter. I absolve you is the form, what's the matter? You. You. Bring in your confession. Okay, so this is, this is what Cain did not do, right? He didn't bring that contrition, that true. Even if it was a contrition of, I'm caught. God can work with that, right? I'm sorry, Lord. But he didn't care for his own life. He just, what am I, my brother's keeper? You can see the arrogance there in that, in that saying, I'm not repentant. I don't care, right? And then what does God do? Sets a mark on him, curses him, sets a mark on him. Right. Actually, he cursed himself. Okay. But he sets a mark on him. So what's this mark? Because he says, this mark, you're driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond upon the earth. And it'll happen that anyone finds me shall kill me. But that's when the Lord said to him, no, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. For the Lord set a mark on him for that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the mark. All right. Well, first of all, being a vagabond on the earth, it's funny how you say, if people see me, they kill me. Because a lot of people think that only Cain and Abel are alive at this time. Because the Bible doesn't talk about anybody else, right? That was that question the first night. Where, where, where did Cain get his wife? Where, where did the other people come from, mm -hmm. right? Well, we know, obviously, there's other people on the earth here because Cain said, if they find me, they'll kill me. Right? I'll be a vagabond upon the earth. Where'd they come from? Mm -hmm. They hope fruitful and multiply, right? Throughout the through lands, and also I'm sure they had grandchildren as well, and, 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 and you know, God commanded that to be fruitful and multiply. So we see Cain is obviously scared, but not scared 
in a good sense, in the sense of, okay, look, I offended God, and but he's scared for you know his own life, but not in a repentant way either. So God puts this mark on him. Whoever kills Cain, shall his life be taken sevenfold. All right. Cain was eventually taken, and all his descendants, not one of the most wrong. All his descendants. Do you know when they were taken? We're going to get to it. There's only the descendant of Seth and Abel that survived after the flood. The flood took out all of Cain's descendants. Okay? So their descendants were eventually taken out. Didn't have to be that way. He chose it, right? Cain chose it. Didn't have to be that way. So let's talk about this mark. Who was Noah the descendant of Abel or Seth? Seth. 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 Yep. Yeah. So, and then we're going to see interesting things with Noah's children, Ham, uh, Jepheth, right, and Shem. And with Melchizedek comes into play when we get there. So I want to jump to that chapter. But So let's talk about this. What do you think the mark was on Cain? Any idea what God put a mark on him? What do you think it was? I mean, I often thought about it. Like oh, the first birth mark or something? Yeah. Well, uh, Catherine Emmerich says something about it. Who it is? It's Catherine Emmerich. She's a mystic. Oh. Remember uh, Sister Catherine Emmerich who wrote on the life of Christ? Mm -hmm. she, she wrote... She had visions. Catherine, if you don't know who she is, she, she wrote some volumes on, on the life of Mary, life of Christ. Like, so she had these yeah. visions that God had showed her and she was sick on her bed, right? That what she was taken back, right, into that time and she saw the visions of exactly how Jesus grew up and what took place. And so she recorded that, allegedly, right? I'm not, I'm not saying everything she recorded is perfect. I don't know. This is private revelation stuff, right? But she talks about this Cain, which, by, uh, I'm sorry, this mark on Cain, which the father says not it. It's funny. She said that God had marked him with a very big dark spot, like a dark skin, so that when he's out there, they would see that he's different from the others. And then they would say, he's the one that did it. Not true. Not true. You know the same thing as the Alvarez church does, dark skin. Who's that? The Alvarez Church. The Mormons. Yeah, they picked up on that. They picked up on that. And that's, and that's totally not true. Why? Well, first of all, <clears throat> it's natural, right, to, because they're in the, the Middle East. But it's also, all the descendants were gone by the flood anyways, right? So that's not it. Others say this mark was possibly some type of tattoo that God had put on it. Like a sign, a mark that he in, etched into his, into his or skin, a, or a scar, or, or a scar, or something. Right? Is that true? Uh, you want to know what uh, the fathers to say about this? They say it was a neurological tremor. Mm. That was the mark. That so was the That's what they say. I don't know 100 percent for sure, but this is what they say, and this is what has been taught. Right? A neurological tremor. Because of the sin, right, of that, that horrific murder he did, God had marked him with this neurological issue. So when they saw him, they knew right away, he's the one. <laughs> Look at him, right? This is more than I can bear. Okay. Um, and so that's a question mark as well. We really don't know. I'm just trying to say, but that's what they've said. So there's different thoughts on this, but for the most part, it's a physical tremor that's what they're, they're, they're alluding to, some sort of physical uh, disorder or you know, some, some type of um, neurological thing going on. So that's what they say. So when they see him out wandering, the reason God put a mark on him so no one would kill him, right? Why, why do you think that is? I mean, why do you say, well, look, God could have taken his life right there and then, right? And matter of fact, as one of the church fathers said, I don't know if it was Augustine or one I just read you Ephraim, that said he sought to be taken by God. He take my life, right? But God let him live through that because why? Well, why does God allow our souls to live forever, even if we end up in hell, right? So... That's more of a torture, in a way, to have to live with yourself than to just sort of end everything, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking you're ending everything. 
because at least you'll be out of your misery, so to speak. But he's always in his misery, recalling what he did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eventually, he he died, but, but God let him live initially. Allowing him to live actually gave him an opportunity. Yeah, to, at some that's point. correct. Actually, could give him an opportunity to repent, right? Mm -hmm. To repent. That's a mercy, right? That's why God doesn't smite us either when we sin and fall into mortal sin, or we're away from, you know, we draw away from God and we're years away from the church, away from Him, away from doing our own thing. God could easily just, you know, take our lives at that point, but He doesn't, right? Thanks be to God, His mercy is there. Same, same. I mean, He's, he's having mercy on Cain, He really is, mm -hmm. right? But Cain, we don't get any hint here that He even repented even being in the desert. Right? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Just says, oh, poor me. You know, I'm going to be a vagabond on the earth. Whoever sees me will kill me. The Lord said no. And I think it's also because he was made in the image and likeness, right? Every, every, every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. So if you're made in the Omega Dei, the image of God, all right, you're special. He was created with reason, intellect. He was created in the image of God. He was created with an immortal soul, right? So God is not just going to He's going to give him time to repent. And even when he takes his arm down on Sodom and Gomorrah, and even when he takes his arm down on the people of the flood, right? And when he comes down on the Jebusites and the Canaanites and all the enemies of Israel, he still gives them ample time to repent, right? I mean, look at Abraham. Look what he did with Abraham when Abraham was praying for Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Lord, if there was only 50 people there, would you say, no, I would not destroy it for the sake of 50. Lord, if there was only 45, would you? And it gets all the way down to 10, all right? Mm. I say you should have kept going. <laughs> if you went down to one, you would have found why. There you go. You know, but, but he did, right? So keep going with God, right? He did. So God did destroy it. But God gave him a chance to repent, right? And he's trying to be merciful there. But he's got justice. That's the thing, justice, all right? God cannot go against this justice. Mercy doesn't... Uh, cancel out justice, but mercy is a type of justice, right? It triumphs over that. And, and so God's just not going to turn his head and say, oh, I'll let him just sin. Okay, I'm a good God. I'm mm -hmm. No, justice is demands that somewhere in the heavens. It demands the, the recompense and the reconciliation and the, and, and the reparation and doing things right. But his mercy triumphs. And somehow the justice does have to be settled. But this is what Christ did too, right? He took upon himself the curse of sin and death and that justice is being settled in heaven. And when we go to Mass, every time it's being offered to the Heavenly Father. And we can offer our prayers in reparation for, for the sins of the world and, and our own sins. So this is, this is something where we find now uh, Cain, right, being out there as a vagabond with this mark. And he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And then Cain knew his wife. There it is again, right? Um, and she conceived in Borinach, and they built a city. Now, and it concludes, basically, this chapter concludes with another son. And the son is Seth. Now, this is where the promise is going to come from. And, 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 and it's Moses, who's the author of Genesis, right, is, is setting this up. And, and we see that in the first day we talked about Moses having genealogies already available to him from Noah, from Adam, from everything. So he could see this and put together Genesis out of this. And so he's setting up this... Deliverer is going to be coming. It was set up in Genesis 3.15 already, right? With God, your enemy should be between you and the woman who is Mary. That's the enemy, right? Uh, to Satan. And what is Mary going to do? She's going to bring forth the redemption of all the mess you guys just made here with original sin, right? Mary is going to be that conduit through which salvation will be initiated and come, which will be Jesus. And so when that comes, from there on out, the, hours, the, the, the clock is ticking, right? For, for when the fullness of time had come, as St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. So that fullness of time is coming, is ticking from that point on, from the fall on, right, right, it's going on. And here we see part of it in verse 25. It says, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son named him Seth. For God had appointed another seed for me, instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Now, I'm going to see if I can show you this. Okay. Let me try to, I don't know if you can see it's very small, but I had to fit it on here. I'm sorry. Maybe I can make it bigger. But anyways, the line is this, right? You have Adam and Eve, 
and you have Cain, Abel, Seth. You notice under Abel there's nobody, there never will be, right? I mean, it's just the way it is. Cain had a bunch of descendants as being marked, being a vagabond on the earth, going out and settling in the land of Nod. He has all these children, but they're all going to be wiped out at the flood. See that one over there, another seed in verse 25? That's Seth. This is where the line is now going to be perpetuating, continue to come down through salvific history, right? Through him and Enosh, right? And Canaan, we're going to have them all. And chapter 5 goes into some of these genealogies, right? And, and actually chapter 5 is, is just a continuation of the genealogy of Adam through Seth. And it's going to give us, what it does is it gives us how long they live, Right? Uh, you know, Adam lived 930 years and he died and, you know, and so on and so forth. So I want to give you a question here as I, as I jump there. Is, and this comes up to me all the time whenever I'm t giving talks on Genesis. How did they live so long? Mm -hmm. Why do we live to be, I don't know, 70, 80, 90, for really strong, 100 maybe, that's it? Why do they get to live to be 969 years old as Methuselah was, the oldest man in the Bible, 969 years old? Why was that? Why do you think that it was? They were closer to perfection. They were closer to perfection, right? They were closer to the priest's false state. Yep, yep. That is, that is a big one. But do you think maybe Noah had something to do with it, with the flood, and, the, and, and what happened with the whole world? They had to start the world over again, so people needed to live longer to be able to, to yep. um, procreate. And God also had said, I know you said this a couple weeks ago too, we talked about God limiting now the age. Man's age will be 120. Then he limits it again underneath that, right? What God says goes. Now, some people say that from a biological or from a scientific Point of view, which science is always in agreement with God. God, it's never true. Science is never going to um, be against the faith ever. It's subservient to it. It's created by God, and it's only going to validate God. Right? True science. It's the pseudo sciences that try to explain things apart from God. But the science says, which may also validate God, says that when the flood happened, the whole atmosphere pressure and the whole atmosphere changed life-wise to sustain life. It wasn't like the pre-fall pristine state, so to speak, even though man was in sin. You know, because the earth was watering itself. You know, there was, there was a firmament in heaven. It was like this greenhouse effect, current effect. But what happened at, at, at the flood? It burst open. Those things burst open, right? The firmament burst open. There was rain, but the firmament, firmament burst open. That's where the, under, the, 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 the volcanic uh, earthquakes happened under under the waters and, and flooded the whole. And then after that, when it settled, that's when things were changing, according to what some scientists say, right? But that validates God. You know, God had said, "I put you know, man shall be 120 and no more." So we see here that they lived a long time. And this basically, you're going to get a lot of Seth's descendants, right? And then it goes on to say that you know, Seth all the days of his life were 912 years. Verse eight, chapter five. And then um, and it goes on to say who he begot and who he begot and so on and so forth. So most of all of chapter 5, without getting into it, because there's nothing really to get depth in there, other than it's a continuation of the genealogy, right, to get to Noah. And it ends with verse 32, it says, And Noah, right, was 500 years old, and he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that's where it ends. Why is it end on Noah? Because Noah's going to play an integral part now, right, of the passing forward of the blessing, right, from God to the future generations. And I want to get into this. Um, uh, I, we can get into to six a little bit. Um, six is not very long. It's about 22 verses. But I want to get into that because I want to talk a little bit. I want to set the stage up for the flood for our final weeks here, which will be chapters 7, 8, and pretty much 9. Um, so who wants to read chapter 6? If anybody, if not, I can read it. I mean, it's up to... Because we do have a microphone that we can pass to somebody if they want to read it. And you don't have to. I can read it. If you want. I will read it if no, if no one else does. Okay.
When mankind had spread all over the world and girls were being born, some of the heavenly beings saw that these girls were beautiful, so they took the ones they liked. Then the Lord said, I will not allow people to live forever. They are mortal. From now on, they will live no longer than 120 years. In those days, and even later, there were giants on the earth who were descendants of human women and the heavenly beings. They were the great heroes and famous men of long ago. When the Lord saw how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, he was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created, and also the animals and the birds, because I am sorry that I have made any of them. But the Lord was pleased with Noah. This is the story of Noah. He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah had no faults and was the only good man of his time. He lived in fellowship with God, but everyone else was evil in God's sight, and violence had spread everywhere. God looked at the world and saw that it was evil, for the people were all living evil lives. God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all mankind. I will destroy them completely, because the world is full of their violent deeds. Build a boat for yourself out of good timber. Make rooms in it and cover it with tar inside and out. Make it 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for the boat and leave a space of 18 inches between the roof and the sides. Build it with three decks and put a door on the side. I am going to send a flood on the earth to destroy every living being. Everything on the earth will die, but I will make a covenant with you. Go into the boat with your wife, your sons, and their wives. Take into the boat with you a male and a female of every kind of animal and of every kind of bird in order to keep them alive. Take along all kinds of food for you and for them. Noah did everything that God commanded. Okay. A couple of things here. We notice right away that as men began to multiply, right, continually, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were beautiful, and they took wives from themselves. Who are these sons of God? Verse 4 gives you a hint. There were giants, or Nephilims. The Nephilims. The Nephilims were on earth in those days, right? And I like uh, that, that version makes it easy for you with the Bible because it gives you the inches and everything here. Mine says cubits and this and that and everything else in the older one. But um, so... The uh, the Nephilims were on the earth, and those. Well, who were they? Well, it was speculation. What do you think they were? Were they the humans that were having relations with not angels, but mm. the... so Book of Enoch talks about this, right? Yeah. Book of Enoch talks about. It. And Jude alludes to it a little bit, but the Book of Enoch talks about these. Now, I'll give you what what I've heard. Okay. Because of that proto evangelium of Genesis three fifteen, right? God said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and hers, right? It goes back to he was already upset at the woman because there's enmity between him and this woman, right, Satan. And it goes back to the whole idea, not a dogmatic thing by any stretch of imagination, but the story, a legend of the church that what is this test that the angels were put to, right? We talked about that, and that was they were shown, right, that... Uh, God would become man through a virgin and this woman, you know, and, and he will not serve anything lower than him. Satan won't serve God if he's going to be in a man type state, lower in nature than him. And, you know, so they rebelled. So this woman got this whole idea of woman and the virgin got him kicked out of heaven anyways, according to this legend. So he's waiting, right, in the garden. And when Adam comes on the scene, he doesn't attack Adam. He's waiting for this woman that he lost the vision to in heaven. Who's this woman? Ah, Eve, this must be the woman. I'm going to go after her. Because if I can foil her, right? I said this a couple weeks ago. If I can foil, get into her, and have her be obedient to me, then she's under my realm, under my domain. I just foiled all of God's plans. But then again, he does. He gets to her. God shows up, says, ah, wrong woman. The woman I'm talking about will crush your head, mm-hmm. right? So because of this, it goes back to that, Right? And so the demons now, this is the story, I don't know how, how true this is, but, or, you know, you can conjecture what you want, but that these are demons, right, who inhabited flesh, who are trying to get in there to marry the daughters of God to mess up the seed for wherever this God was going to come. They were totally off base, right? So they wanted to mess up all of God's line. So if I just get in there and marry all these things and start 
you know, having children by them and all, it'll be so messed up that it, the God's plan will be foiled. That, that's one, that's one, you know, type of interpretation I heard. They, they, they were demons who inhabited somehow, you know, and we, can, we know the angels can inhabit a body. We know that they can. Look at Raphael in the book of Tobit. Right? If you're at the book of Tobit, Raphael is the angel from heaven, one of the archangels, who disguised himself as a true Israelite brother of Tobias, right? Whose father's Tobit, and he helps him in the end. He heals his blindness and everything. So, so that's the, the thought, right? He'll confuse the seed, the seed, right? That ended in chapter five, uh, in chapter four, right? Another seed shall come down. They don't know who the seed is, but we're going to try to mess it all up. The sons of God also can refer to these male descendants, right? Um, of a human line, not just a demonic line, but that were unrighteous and were banished sort of from, from the state of Israel. Uh, so there's a couple different interpretations of what they are, but nonetheless, what were they doing? They were enticing, they were being promiscuous. They were, they were trying to marry, right, the daughters of men and bore children. They did, they bore children to them. And those were the mighty men of old. But the Lord saw this wickedness, right? So he called it wickedness. And that every intent of the thought of the heart of man was evil continually. Now, this is leading up to the flood. What do you think was happening back then that the evil was really building up and building up and building up? Are we sure that the Nephilim were not descendants of Cain? Because <clears throat> That's the other thing. They can be. They okay. absolutely can be. Because they can't reproduce. They're, they're spirits. They can't reproduce. They may that's that's the argument against it. That, that's the argument against reproduce. it. Now, here's the thing. Could they have possessed the descendants of Cain mm -hmm. to try to get into the seed? That's the other thing. Yeah. But this whole thing revolves around a city, right? Because Cain went and he built the city. We, we saw this in chapter 4, right? That he's building a city. And so when we think of big cities, even today, what do we think of? What, what's one of the first things that come to your mind when you think of big city life, big city crime, right? Mm -hmm. more, more opportunity for crime, more opportunity from evil, right? Not necessarily, but for the most part, than a small town, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Cain went and built this big city. So Cain's descendants were evil, which are eventually wiped out when the flood's coming, right. right? So they're saying that this city and the Cain's line were, were prostituting themselves, right? That's the other thing. Being possessed by this Nephilim, by these giants, by these demons, right? So they did have a say in this, the demonic dead, right? Um, and they're on full exhibit there. So they uh, actually ended up upsetting the Lord very, very big. And the Lord said, that's it. Man's heart is continually evil. And I'm sorry that I made man. Sorry that he made man. Can you imagine that? Evil. Sorry that he made man. Looking for your parent. <laughs> take, take care. We're talking about Noah. That's Noah. Um, so the earth was corrupt before God and was filled with violence. So the Lord God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all the flesh had corrupted the ways on earth. What else was happening at this time that caused the flood? Something big was happening at this time. We see it today in our culture big time. Yeah. Yes, it was Sodom. It was huge, right? It was building up to Sodom and Gomorrah, which is coming, but it was huge here, right? And I'm going to say something that I said before, and we're going to see this when we get to chapter 9 about the rainbow, right? That's going to be a sign about all this, okay? And we'll talk about that when, when we get there. Brian, I, I, uh, about, I saw an email. I don't know what you think of this, but... It suggested, and I can't remember all the arguments that were made, it suggested when the Lord said that in the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage, he was referring to homosexual marriage. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you give that any credence? I do, I do. do, do? So, so, yes, absolutely. <laughs> but okay. it's not the, the uh, obviously, it's, it's not the mental marriage. <laughs> it can nowhere be. It's not even really a marriage, right? Right, right. Marriage. But, but uh, yes, so, and the hint is um, coming up with Sodom and Gomorrah. That's going to be the hint, right? I mean, that's after, but, but what's going to happen is we're going to see the uh, 
the layout of the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, right? It's going to be like that at the end, right? When God's mm. not going to destroy the earth with a flood, with water again, fire, most possibly, <laughs> but not, not, not water, because um, he's making that covenant. But yes, the giving of marriage and, and taking, there was a lot of that promiscuous uh, heterosexual fornication, adultery going on, but there was also mm. um, homosexual acts going on as well, very much. And that's one of the four sins that cries to God to heaven, I believe, right? Uh, abortion, uh, uh, actually widows, um, not neglecting the widows and everything that cries out uh, to heaven. There's four major sins that cry out to heaven, and, and uh, this one here is, is a major, major one, right? The, the, the homosexual acts and the sodomitical acts. And that's what God is seeing and says, the whole earth is corrupt, right? Because of that and filled with violence. Now, today, the whole earth is well, not the whole earth, but it's filled with that too. Why aren't we being destroyed like they, they were then? Any, any reason? Any, any thoughts? I mean, I don't, I'm not going to tell you definitively why, but I have my thoughts on why. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? Because maybe we're in a waiting period. What's that? Maybe we're in a waiting period. <laughs> we are in a waiting period. There's no doubt about it. It took a century, it took 100 years to build it. I think Brandon is suggesting that maybe the, the reason that the sword came down and Genesis doesn't come down yet, is that it just hasn't come down yet. It's coming. That's what he's saying. I think because of what Abraham did when he was begging God, you know, would you, you know, mm -hmm. the Sodom and Gomorrah, would, if I could find five righteous men, would you spare the town? And I really think because there's so many of us faithful that we are very devout and really praying that it, it, it has been holding off. So prayers do, definitely, right? They, Plus, they do. Uh, um, what we said before about God giving us a chance mm -hmm. to repent. Mm -hmm. So Our definitely life, prayers can change things. It changed guys. God, he relented, right? Moses changed God's mind through prayer. Right. He wanted to wipe out all those people doing the golden calf. And Everybody. And now we have a lady interceding for us. Ah, so here it is, right? I think. Christ wasn't manifested yet, right? His, the mercy of God in the Messiah who came and died, shed his blood on the cross, didn't happen yet in history and time, right? And for, so we're under a dispensation, so to speak. You know, not that it's okay. It's not okay. But who sort of holds back the arm of justice in a way, so to speak, right? We do it the Mass. We have the Mass. We offer the Eternal Father the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, right? He's offering himself constantly speaking before the throne of the Father, his blood, right? Did they have that in the days of Noah? No, even though Christ was definitely in the Old Testament. It's called a Christology, a theophany, you know, and all those. A Christophany was when Christ appeared. Such as in the in the um, burning furnace, the fourth man. It's like a son of man's in the fiery furnace that Daniel saw. This was, this was, um, that was a Christophany, a, a form of Christ in the Old Testament. But because the fullness of time had come, this is my, this is my, and Christ died for us, right? And his blood is forever being, well, right now is being, a peace to the Father in heaven. And in Mass, we offer that back up to the Father. And could that be stave in the arm? Or else we'd be long gone like mm -hmm. Noah's time. Mm -hmm. Just about. Yeah. I don't know. Brian, early on, all of this, uh, uh, these misdeeds were going on. People were acting, there was all this evil. Mm -hmm. But there was no guidance. There was no, you know, now we have we have a history to look back on and, you know, we're, we're, we... Well, see, that's why it's worse for them. That's why it's worse for them. Because God spoke to them directly. I mean, Adam and Eve and Cain, and he didn't speak, right? He's not speaking directly to your ear. I mean, he does to your heart when you pray. But the Old Testament's like this, because I heard this. I've heard this, this complaint. It's like, well, the Old Testament... It's like two different gods, right? The Old Testament God was like this angry tyrant who put everybody to death. And the New Testament's like, oh, a whole different God. He's merciful, he's justice. Now, same God dealing with two different forms of people, right? When you're young, and that's what they were. They were young people. They were, were newly made. They were, when you're young, you have to deal harder, right, with your children. See what I mean? Yeah. Don't touch this. Don't go on the road. You're, you're, you're grounded. I'm going to speak, right? You have to do that, Okay. As time goes on, right, and your children grow, you deal with them differently. 
You reason with, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Let us, so, so you're, not, you're not dealing with two different gods. You're dealing with the same God who's dealing with two different types of people, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament needed that. Get in line, do this. That, yeah, you know. there was not experience. Right, yeah. that's right. So, so whereas us, you know, there, there is a more of a dispensation of, when I mean dispensation, it's like the age of mercy and grace seems to be, there was mercy and grace in the Old Testament too. But as far as the God was like, they're teaching them every step of the way, this is what you do, and they still were like, mm, mm. Or we got people teaching us, right? We have the priest, we have the majesty, and the church teaching us, and we know what to do, right? Um, but God was like right there as the father to his young children telling them what to do. And this is, this is why, to me, in the Old Testament, that wrath was configured harder, right? Because they almost like were right next to him and they knew better and they didn't do it. Uh, Moses, Moses met with God, I mean, face to face pretty much, right? I mean, up on the mountain and, and he told him, this is what I tell my people, right? And that's when he started setting up leadership in that sense, in which we have today in the church, right? Sometime we should do an Exodus study, but, but, it's, um, but I think that's why, I mean, I do. But prior to Noah, okay, prior to Noah, mm -hmm. Were there any prophets? Was there any guidance? I mean, yeah. obviously God spoke to yeah. certain individuals, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the internet to send, send the no, word. No, out. There, was, there was, there was. Matter of fact, the Jews were very, very, very good at passing on the word, oral tradition, more so than any other religion or faith in, in the history that I know of. So they, when they say, when God told them something, They'd pass it to their children, and to the children's children, right down to the letter. They, they, they were famous because they had to survive, right? I mean, they, they had to, and this is how they would survive. So they, they had it. Even though the law wasn't written, so to speak, um, like on the Ten Commandments, which will come with, with Moses, mm -hmm. but God was there in every moment of their lives, right? Teaching them and teaching but, but was them. Was that happening prior to Noah? Yes, yes it was. Yes it was, yeah. Matter of fact, we just saw it with Cain, right? Cain. You knew what to do. Why did you do this? And Cain's talking back to God. It's like, you know. So we saw that there was this guidance with God with his children along the way, right from Adam, right from Adam to Cain. Abel's gone. Now Seth, now Noah, right? We're, we're, we're seeing that. And, and of course, all those others that are out there also had that same opportunity because they came from the same parents. They came from Adam and Eve, right? So so they chose to rebel. Adam and Eve the law. He, he did. Told them he what did. To do and what not to do. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. they had free will, so they. They, they did. That, that's the thing with free will. Uh, who was it? Augustine said, "Oh, happy fault," right? <laughs> Which means that it's not a great thing that we fell, you know. Uh, but magnificent grace came out of that because now redemption can happen, right? So we fell, I and mean, we fell, and thus we all contracted original sin, right? Because of that, but. In the end, it's, oh, happy fault for those redeemed, right? Because because of that, now I can be redeemed and experience that, that from God, that redemption, that love, that mercy from God that I don't deserve, right? Now I can, because of the fall, because I'm a sinner, because I'm in original sin, I can experience that, right? Um, and so that's what Augustine meant by, oh, happy fault. So, yeah, I mean, the law was given to them. They had free will, and they decide to... to but then with that free will comes just... Well, yeah. yeah. See, and this is what I talked yeah. about last week, right? Free will, you can choose, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that when you choose against God, that's what sin means, right? Sin means missing the mark. You're not hitting the mark of God, right? You're, you're, you're choosing against him. Um, the wages of it is death automatically, right? right? That's what St. Paul tells us, and I think it's Romans 6.33. The wages of sin is death. And, and death is not just you know, physical, which is a result of sin, which we must die someday, but it's spiritual. That's why we have to go to confession, right? To resurrect our, our, our souls again. And so um, when that happened, we get the law that guides us and God talked to his people first. Then he puts the law in place, right? With, through Moses. And then he puts the Levitical priesthood in place. And you can see the ministerial priesthood developing. Then we get the New Testament. We have the church, you know, developing, right? So it's not like he pulled away. He's working through He's working through it. But early on, it was that father and child relationship. Boom, right there. Telling him himself, this is what you are to do. He told Cain, Cain, you know what to do. If you do good, 
won't you be acceptable in my sight? He told him that. Cain's like, you know, Cain knew. Hmm. He just didn't want to do it, right? Right, because he wouldn't have just created us and then left us no. there hanging. No, that's deism, right? So that, that's, that, that's what the deists say. The deists mean there was a God who started everything, right? Start, kicked it off, and then boom. Just let it take its <laughs> spin, whatever it is. And if you need me, I'll be over here sleeping, you know, type of thing. That's, that's deism. That's as a deist mentality. That's not God. He's active all the time. In his creation. Matter of fact, if he wasn't active, we'd all be like Abel, which Abel's name, vapor, disintegrate, right? So he upholds us, he upholds all things by the word of his power. So, yes, he had that. And we're gonna see how it develops, though, how that law develops, how the how the ways of God gets to be developed through the nation of Israel, through through and this one I'm to talk about covenants, and that's the last thing I'll talk about here because I know we're probably over. Yeah, a little bit over. Um, so covenants, God is establishing them right from Adam and Eve, right? He establishes, um, I'll turn this off so I don't bore you with this. He establishes covenants. What do you think the first covenant was with? Let there be and light, and there's light. Let the fish team, yeah. let the creation, yeah. right? So he executes out creations at first. Then he makes Adam and Eve, and what do you think that covenant is? Marriage. marriage, yeah, marital. It's a marital one. So, so there's 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 seven covenants, just like there's seven sacraments in the church, right? So, from as a, it, naturally from a marriage comes what? Children. Children. Okay. So then we have a covenant with Noah and his children, and they all saved on the ark. Then the covenant moves from a family to a tribe, right? And so you have. The tribe, Abraham, and everything. Right? Then it moves from there to where a nation, a, a, a kingdom, a nation, right of Israel, kingdom, David in the kingdom, to finally Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate covenant of the whole universe. Right? He is the new covenant. He is the diatheke, which means testament. Right? And I don't know if you knew this, but the New Testament, the word New Testament is a person that wasn't meant to be a book. It was meant to be a person. The New Testament scriptures, the scriptures in the New Testament were made for the mass. So the diatheke, the covenant, the testament is a person. It's Jesus Christ. He is the New Testament. The words in the Bible, which are, you know, the, the actual infallible word of God, right? The inerrant word of God, inspired word of God. They're, they're called New Testament because they're written for the New Testament himself. And they're written actually for mass. So... That covenant, he is the new covenant, which means the covenant which seals all seven, right, everything, right from creation, right to revelation. That's why it's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, because he initiated creation. All things were created through this right here, going right back to day one. When God created the heavens and the earth, that word created is bara. Remember this? Yes. Bar means sun in Aramaic, right? Bara means to create ex nihilo out of nothing. So what's God doing? He's creating through the Son, through his Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. That's why John, in his first prologue gospel, said, in the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. All things were created through him, and nothing was made that was made apart from him. That's what he's talking about, Genesis. And guess what? That same Word that was created, right, from the Word to us is the same one that will save us from what the fall did. So that's how you tie in the thread of Genesis all the way to the end, the alpha, the beginning of the, of the alphabet, the omega, the very end of the Greek alphabet. And as the Jews say, it's the elf tav, elf mem tav, right? He's everything in between as well. So, so we'll pick it up with chapter six again and go into seven, because there's a little bit more on six I'll do next time, but we're well past our time here. So any final questions or thoughts on Cain or anything? If you weren't here for the first couple, um, I think it is recorded, but you know, like how do you I, the recordings? he records them. In, in I know, but how do you access it? So right now, um, it's just a link to the recordings, but eventually the church office is going to clear it up somewhere on the website for everybody to hear. I don't know what the status is of that, but I have handed them the past two recordings so far. Yeah. So I think it's uh, Giselle's her name or, or yeah, Gabrielle. Gabrielle. Gabrielle's the Gabrielle. one. Gabrielle, yeah, she, she was sick last week. Oh, she's sick. Okay, so I think she because she did write and said she's gonna put them up there. 
She's so, going to do a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You, you referred earlier to science and mm -hmm. this, you know, being in, in sync with faith and invention, pseudoscience. What, yes. What's the difference? Pseudoscience, pseudo means false. Yeah. Okay. So pseudoscience is a science that is not based on facts or objectionable observations. So true point. science is empirical, right? right? So what it does is it takes the empirical data and makes an objective decision based on what they see. Pseudoscience places something in there that's not there, okay? All for a philosophical end, not a scientific end. So they have a philosophical um, agenda, meaning that man will decide what we want. So I will, so they'll, they'll come up with, with, even if things are proven, a prime example, prime example that I'm going to give you is in the case of abortion. Mm -hmm. They say that it's just a fetus. It's just a blob of tissue. It's not a human. It's not a human, right? But science has determined, yes, it is. At the moment of conception, it is, it, it is a human, right? It is the moment of conception. But the science the pseudoscience says no. Now, there's a why are they saying no when they clearly, objectively have defined that it was? Because there's a philosophical underlying current there that's not objectionably going in and looking at the data and say, yes, this is it. Even if I don't agree with it, it's the facts, it's right there. They'll take it out to meet an end goal of theirs. That's what pseudoscience is. And there's pseudoscience all over the place today. All of, on studies on it's prolific. it's prolific out there. Not just abortion, but you know, evolution. We're talking it's pseudoscience on identity, gender, gender yeah. everything, everything, everything. Um, what about evolution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we covered that our first. Our oh, first sorry. Time. No, no, that's okay. We can talk about it. If you want to stay? We can talk about it. Yeah, we 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 just we we talked about evolution and Darwin in the eighteen hundreds, and you know. Um, Origin of species and the missing link and where is that? And matter of fact, everything doesn't evolve. The science proves it's devolving, right? You can't give what you don't have. That's a scientific fact, right? Things don't, you can't give something you don't have, right? So how did we evolve into a human being from a amoeba state life that can't, doesn't have that to give us that? See, so that's scientific, but the pseudoscience says, well, we did, <laughs> you know. Okay, so what is, what is, why? Why are you saying that? Is it to get God out of the picture? Is it to say, well, you know, we've evolved because it makes us They throw super? it all back to your free will. Yeah, I know, I'm just saying, so that's, just, that's an example of, yeah, pseudo just means a false science, or a science that's skewed to meet an agenda. To meet an agenda. To meet an agenda, which ne doesn't really help yeah, you. They don't get the consequences, they don't throw in the yeah. consequences. Yeah, but, but true science, though, I mean, which means objectionable, uh, uh, objective, objective um, science will confirm, it will confirm the word of God and confirm the truth, because it is the truth, the truth is what it is. Uh, so the, um, you know, you know it's they, the thought of they, lies. When you had those Eucharistic miracles and you were talking about the scientists who were testing on the, the blood and the, yes. and the, and the, yeah. uh, the, the Eucharist that they tested, they said they were human cells. Yeah. That should have woken up everybody because the cells that they're pulling, they're saying that it's just cells, they're just cells, they're just... So you remember the parable, the you, remember the, you remember the parable that Jesus told about the rich man dying, yeah. eating in the scraps of his table, fell on Lazarus, poor, poor man Lazarus. What happened there? Yeah. Lazarus was eating the poor scraps, and then the rich man, it said Lazarus died, and was carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The, Lazarus did, right? The rich man died and was buried, right? Never carried the angels, never blah, 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 buried. Hell yeah. Then they had this conversation after, after the death. What did he say? Just let me cross over so I can get a tip of the water from it. Nope, no one can cross over. Then let me go and warn my family. Let me appear no, to them. Lazarus go and warm his family. Well, Lazarus, go yeah, and warm yeah. the family so that so that they can know. What did what was the response from God? Not even if someone Not even if someone was to rise from the dead and appear to them, they would they would believe. Because they had the law and the prophets and they refused to believe them. Mm -hmm. So even if one was to rise from the dead, they wouldn't believe. Okay. So there's your answer. Right. You think that that would be the case that everybody would be like, wow, a Eucharistic miracle. This is real. 
they're still not, there's your definition of a pseudoscience. Because, no, nope, not, not real, not real, not real. It's not real. And, and so they, then they place an explanation behind why it's not real. And it, it's not even a scientific explanation. It's more of a philosophical mm. explanation, see. And so that, it's agendas. It's, and that's what's happening. Now, there is beautiful science out there. Absolutely, absolutely beautiful science. But there's a lot of um, pseudo as well out there to meet agendas. Money is a big one, right? Um, you know, fame, notoriety. It just whatever's in the hearts of men, you know? I mean, it's what happens when they're apart from God. Anything can happen, yeah. evil. But anyway, so any other final thoughts or questions? Cherish your heart. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, thank you very much. We'll meet next week. We've only got two more left. Thank you, Deacon Brian. Yeah. Thanks, Brian.